412, correct? 412, authorizing a competitive solicitation for security services for the Smart Park garages and the Portland Streetcar facility at an estimated amount that of cool. $4 million for five years. That was cool. also asking this speaker to come out. Yeah, that was already uh, 412 cool. is also returned to Commissioner Saltzman's office. Uh, so what I'd like to do now, since I believe we are at we're at 414 on the regular, is that correct? Now we still have 401 through 407 pulled from the consent agenda. What I'd like to do is read all of those together since they're all related to the same issue with the multi-tax exemption program. So let's go ahead and read 401 to 407 and I believe that clears the consent agenda, is that correct? Uh, 413 still. Um, pulled from the consent. Let's do 413 first then, I'm sorry. Thank you. 413, authorize grant agreement of $50,000 with the Kenton Action Plan, doing business as North Portland Community Works, to provide livability, liability insurance coverage for neighborhood association and community activities in North Portland. And is there somebody from staff to speak to that issue? Oh, here comes somebody right now. What was it? Who pulled it? Uh, 413. Who Mr. pulled 413? Uh, Mr. Walsh. Joe. <laughs> so upset. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michelle Rodriguez and I work for the Office of Neighborhood Involvement. And I'm the management analyst. Uh, this grant, uh, as was stated, covers insurance for neighborhood associations and small nonprofits to cover programs and events. Um, it's done with all of the coalition offices, not just North Portland, which I know was a question that was asked. Um, some examples of nonprofits that receive this insurance for their events or programs are um, Viva Buffy, which it creates art healing projects and public art to energize and chant and heal. Viva Buffy recruits and develops artists from vulnerable, marginalized populations. The paid artist interns use art action to activate change in the community. Um, North Portland Tube Library also are, is a recipient of the insurance uh, where they host free events like the Repair Cafe where volunteers fix small appliances, garments and bikes, as well as sharpening tools, knives, and fixing small engines. Um, Portland Abbey Arts, which is a non-religious nonprofit's arts and community development initiative fostering creativity and the development of diverse, vital, passion-rooted, and resilient community in North Portland via arts education events hosted at St. Andrews and Cambridge. Those are just some examples of the organizations that receive this insurance through my program. Very good. You uh, may take a seat, and then we'll uh, take the public testimony, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Walsh. Good morning. <laughs> and Bridge Gray. <laughs> good morning. Uh, my name is Joe Walsh. I represent individuals for justice for the record. This morning on the way here, uh, on a bus, uh, because we were delayed so much, I decided to reread some of the supporting documentation on this item and uh, some of the other items that we pulled. And uh, they are now traveling on TriMet somewhere in the city. So I don't have my notes present. <laughs> I lost it. But off the top of my head, I remember when we discussed this, we were confused about whether it was $10,000 or $50,000 the supporting documentation uses $10,000 a number of times, but this says $50,000. <laughs> we have no objection to, to the main part. We would ask, though, that you consider doing an amendment or ask them to put into their action plan a proposal <clears throat> that when we have to be a weather, that they open up their center. That it seems to us that we're working with county, we are working with you on some level, I'm not sure what level, but uh, we all are working with the county. And we're concerned about when we get notification from the Weather Bureau that we are going to have a severe weather, we get usually three to five days notice. So in the preparations, and that's what we're demanding, that you start preparations then, and we get everybody in place then, not wait for the event. That includes opening up the centers for warming places. So we would like, if you're giving them $50,000 and we're giving them money, 
it seems to me we can say to them, you know what? When we get into a critical emergency situation and we're all running around crazy, we want you to open up the center. You know? We would take that as a message that you're with us. And maybe next time around we'll give you a hundred thousand dollars. Don't say that. But you can imply that. You know, if, if you are nice to me, I'm more than likely to be nice to you. So that's what we, we came up with. Uh, we realize uh, uh, we probably won't get it this time around, but eventually we will. And what we want is very simple. When you get noticed that we are in an emergency, whether it's high temperature, low temperature, you have to take the human position and say, we're going to lose some people on the street if we don't get them off now. Not wait, because if you wait until it hits, Nobody moves. We can't move. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good morning. Oh, good. Good to the morning. Charles Bridgepin Charles Johnson. And um, I just want to speak hardly on this as, uh, because I believe it's the Kenton area that has, uh, is kind of leading the way in uh, opening our community to tiny homes and uh, creating a place for women who have had some uh, very unfortunate circumstances to try a new. Uh, tiny home way of life. I know this funding is uh, separate. I think Mr. Walsh has a question of 10,000 versus 50,000 is because you, uh, you're talking about as an aggregate appropriation for five years, um, but actually I would only apply 10,000 to each annual budget cycle. So um, I encourage uh, this. It's interesting that I've seen an uh, action plan this type of item, and it's probably just lapse of memory, but all the time that there's been an East Portland action plan, I'd love to know, we can look later to see if they've got traction for similar funding. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fish? Uh, we don't need to bring Ms. Rodriguez back up, but can we just confirm for the record that it's $10,000 for the next fiscal year and the contract is for not to exceed five years, so it could not to exceed 50000 is that correct? And that, that will reckon that answers Mr. Walsh's question because the impact statement says the impact for the next fiscal year is ten thousand dollars, but the contract is for a period of up to five years. Uh, legal counsel has it on the ordinance. Uh, just one moment, legal counsel. Mayor, uh, I was going to just recommend that uh, in section three A of the contract that's attached to the ordinance that the um, points made by Commissioner Fish regarding that the contract is for an uh, annual amount of $10,000 up to a total of $50,000 for the contract term of five years. <coughs> that language to that effect be added to Section 3A. That's so to clarify. We have a motion. Second. Commissioner Fish moves. Commissioner Fritz seconds the recommendation of legal counsel called the roll on the amendment. I think this is a clarifying amendment, and I appreciate the testimony. Aye. Aye. Can you just take our bit and go and discuss what's happening? Aye. All right. So the amendment is adopted. Uh, any further questions or discussion on the main motion? Please call the roll. Aye. So um, there is the uh, coalition in North Portland called North Portland Cares, and they, uh, particularly many of the faith communities in North Portland, um, whether there's an urgent um, weather emergency or not, are very dedicated to helping people um, to get inside during uh, inclement weather. Yeah. Roosevelt High School um, has, is serving uh, people who live out, students who live outside, and they open their doors very early to allow um, people to come in, take showers, and stay later into the evening. So um, mm. I don't know whether the Kenton uh, Firehouse was used for emergency um, uses in the past winter. I do know that the um, Care North Portland Caring Community um, um, is, is uh, right on it and agrees that everybody should be inside. Hi. I agree with the testimony around better collaborative preparation when we know that we're going to have a severe weather event. And uh, as some of you all recall, 
Uh, I began my term with a series of weather events that had been unprecedented, at least in my lifetime. And the fact of the matter is, we were not as well prepared as we could have been in terms of working with other government agencies, in terms of working with nonprofits and community organizations. And we had to do an awful lot of that work on the fly. Uh, the good news is I think we learned a, two, uh, a lesson or two from that experience in terms of preparation and collaboration and uh, the Joint Office of Homelessness Services has really stepped up in a big way and I feel like we are now better prepared for those kinds of situations. And I also agree with just the philosophy that to the degree that we are providing support services for community organizations, there should be clarification that we are partners. And partner doesn't mean that the city provides money and is gone. It means there are certain services that are provided. And yes, uh, in a community emergency, we shall pull together. And um, you know, I, I can only speak to a couple of these organizations on this list. I know they would need that call, but I, I think it's actually a, a good conversation to have going forward. So I, uh, the grant agreement is approved. Let's do this, let's read 401 through 407 together. We have to vote on them individually, but they're all very much related to the same type of program. So we'll read them all, we'll take testimony on it, and then we'll vote on them individually. 401 and 407, if you could read those items, please. 401, approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program for Block 290 KOTI apartments, located at 1417 Northwest 20th Avenue, 402, approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program for Petty Grove Apartments located at 2216 Northwest Petty Grove Street. 403, approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program for Southwest Start plus Columbia Apartments located at Southwest Park Avenue and Southwest Columbia Street. 404, approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program for Third Avenue or 3rd and Ash, located at 108 Southwest 3rd Avenue and 405. Approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program for Atomic Orchard Lofts, located at 2510 Northeast Sandy Boulevard. 406, approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program for Block 33, located at 125 Northwest 4th Avenue and 407, approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program for Woody Guthrie Place Apartments located at 5728 Northeast 91st Avenue. Good morning. Good morning. So if you could just give us a, a brief overview of uh, this tax exemption program, what the qualifications are, why they have been awarded to these particular projects. That will probably answer a lot of the questions that people may have. Then we'll take some public testimony. You may have more, may have different questions than those, which basically we can bring you back to you. If you want to take a stab at some of that. Excellent. My name is Dory Van Wackel. I'm with the Housing Bureau and the coordinator for the multi program. The multiple unit limited tax exemption program is a 10 year exemption that is uh, provided on development projects within the city of Portland. Um, in exchange for additional public benefits that wouldn't necessarily be included in the projects. And primarily, that is affordability. So all of these projects have additional, or have affordability at either 20% of the project limited at 60% of area median income over that 10 year period, or 80% of area median income. And it depends upon the market rents for that type of, uh, of the type of units being provided in the building. So based on the area, size, um, the amenities, etc. So uh, you, you give a 10-year tax exemption, and then how long does the affordability last? With these projects, it's the same 10 years of the period of the exemption that the affordability lasts. Great. Um, so why don't we take public testimony, you go ahead and have a seat, and uh, if there's further questions, we might have you come up again. Uh-oh. <coughs> Please don't matter the time, it's about the time yet. Uh, just for clarification, I'm requesting that we do each individual one instead of the group, or you can agree to 
whatever objections that I raised in 401 will go to all of them, and that would be on the record. That, that is correct. So we're taking testimony. That's right. I, I don't want to waste your time because a lot of it's going to be uh, repetitious. However, they are individuals. We do have a right to three minutes on each one. So we're willing to give that up if the record shows that whatever objections we raise on 401 will also be incorporated into the rest of it. Do you agree? agree? Yes, agree. Okay. Thank you. Again. <laughs> It's a little complicated because I don't have my notes. So, what I remember is that the first one, 401, and correct me if I'm wrong, is 80%. They're taking a percentage and, and lowering some of the apartments. All right, so you have a studio, you have one bedroom, you have two bedrooms, and a lot of these uh, uh, developments or extensions, some of them are extensions. Some of them are new. Some of them are 80%. Some of them are 60%. So when we were looking at it, we said, you know, the income for Portland is now rated at $73,000. I don't make $73,000. Mm. Sure enough, I'm retired. Don't make it. Right. So if you take 80% of that, it's still in the high 60s. I'm doing my math correctly. So what does that have to do with low income? Nothing. These all have nothing to do with low income. Somebody like me who makes on retirement 35000 somewhere around there, I can't qualify for these places. So what does that have to do with our problem? We have a problem with people on the street. We have a problem with people hanging by their fingernails, asking for help. And you know that because we we sell help them with their rent. We give them money so they don't get thrown out on the street. And we help them on the street. And we build shelters, emergency shelters that last for 40 years. Did you ever? know that emergency shelters would last 40 years? <laughs> Salvation Army's emergency what? shelter, how old is it? About 40 years. And they say, we've been doing this for 40 years. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you are giving millions of dollars in tax breaks to these guys. Well, a 10-year period, it's about Five, six million dollars. For what? For people that can afford sixty thousand dollars, get sixty thousand dollars as a base? Why are we doing that? And what money are we using? Are we using the house's money for that? Are we using federal money for that? What kind of money are we using? Or are we just writing it off? And you know when you write it off, ten years down the line you say, oh, I can't tell you that money. Just write it off. No, it comes from someplace. That's from somebody's pocket. So, those are our objections, and we demand not 80 percent. We demand 40 percent. That would bring you still into 30, 38,000 somewhere around there. That's reasonable. That's reasonable. You're not being reasonable with the taxpayers' money, and you're giving tax breaks to your buddies in the millions, millions. Can you hear me, people? Thank millions. You. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Uh, good morning. My name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Watchdog. One of the things I want to have a maybe a more clear understanding on these type of projects is that when these projects are, are rolled out to the public with these type of tax benefits. I also want to see how many jobs are going to be created per each project. I want to have an understanding of that. I want to start hearing that on every project we talk about. How many people are going to be employed? How much are we going to end up paying all those people? Uh, I want to start hearing that more and more. I want to start seeing the actual square footage of the units, which is 
I think very important to establish what the market rent would be on looking at other locations. Uh, again, I want to have an understanding on the materials that are going to be bought on these projects, what the dollar amount will be, different type of material purchase. I want to have a clear understanding of all the benefits that will happen throughout this city because of these projects. We don't normally emphasize that on the jobs created, who's going to be employed working there, who's going to be employed working there thereafter, the benefits of the people renting in these projects. I want to have a clear understanding of the jobs created. It's a very important issue when you're talking public benefits and subsidies that are going toward these projects that we don't emphasize on when people say, I don't like this, I want to know how many people are going to be working. I think you're talking about the construction jobs. A early. Absolutely. And, and there's a precedent for that. Uh, when we got the stimulus money uh, back in 09 or something, and we had shovel-ready projects, remember, that we put the, the Obama stimulus money to? We, we had to track the economic impact. And yeah. that was impressive. Okay, and that's, that's why I think that's very important to do that. Issue number two on these, when the people do not follow through with the program, I assume they have to pay back that money. Uh, if they, for instance, do a sale in five years, I assume that program ends or can it be extended to the new buyer? That's a, just a question I'm throwing out there. Uh, and again, uh, just my understanding on the, just from hearing from some developers in the marketplace, there has to be more incentives to create more inventory, plain and simple, if you want lower rents. Now, people are looking at the rent control, they're looking at the inclusionary zoning, which, again, if the developers are saying they're backing away from certain projects, we have to readjust to continue to have rapid development of new properties out there which will begin to drop the prices in the overall market. If you do not do that and you limit the inventory, the rents will continue to go up, people will not be able to live within the urban areas, and it has to be adjusted to where they want to keep building these type of units, which does add employment throughout the community. So I approve all of this. Uh, I'm just at more inventory or reduced prices, so that's my position there. Very good, thank you. Good morning. Hi. My name is Mary Sight. It's nice to see you again. Um, I want to hit on a little bit of uh, the population that this uh, program addresses. Uh, every time we hear uh, conversations about affordable housing, and, uh, we, there's a huge segment of the population doesn't get addressed. And that is people like myself, who are um, over 65, uh, people like uh, myself who are um, going be deemed disabled, who are living in this type of housing. Um, just to give some clarification, 60% um, of FMI, the building that I live in, a single person uh, cannot make more than 50% or 60% of the MFI. Uh, which means for a person like myself, the maximum amount of money that I can make in order to continue to live in the housing that I live in is about $24,000. My Social Security is about $19,000. So just because that's the ceiling, it doesn't even mean that I can make that much. Um, the building I live in, there are over uh, 200 uh, income-restricted units. The majority of the people that live there are like myself, people who um, uh, perhaps during the recession like myself, uh, due to corporate reorganization, lost their job, lost their home, lost their car, lost their dignity. And without this, we would have no place to go. We will be the next people sleeping on the sidewalk. Um, we need to support as many of these programs as we can. I'm so sorry. Um, as you can tell, this is a very um, serious problem, and we're overlooking a huge segment of the population um, that is going to be on the street. 
And so every program that you can put together to increase the number of affordable units in our city is critical. Um, thank you. I thank appreciate you. it. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you. I'm Thanks. just going to some regards to the stuff you previously testified. What if people then uh, start uh, getting that to a higher income? And do those folks have to move out right. to the affordable uh, units? So I'll ask that to staff after we have Thank right. you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for clarifying because there, there's a lot of confusion. Unfortunately, you know, I, I've come to find out that affordable housing has its own language yes. and it is not helpful. Um, so these MFIs, it depends how many people in your household and it's a threshold income. So for example, you mentioned that in your uh, situation, you know, it's 24,000. Um, I, I don't have the 2016 data in my head, but I remember the 2015 data for a household of one is about 30,000. Right. So that's the maximum threshold. Exactly. It doesn't mean the people living there make an income of $30,000. Exactly. And so, and, and you know, while, while I'm on a terror, there was a really good question asked, well, what is the source of funding? It's not tax dollars coming out of current tax proceeds. Future. It's for non tax dollars that those projects would generate. In other words, if the projects aren't built, there wouldn't be any tax dollars anyway. So we're foregoing 10 years of some percentage of tax collection and exemption in exchange for making that project work as a non market rate building. Because right now, if you're developing a project, you want to develop market rate housing and go for the top end. So we're actually buying down the affordability in those buildings by providing the tax exemption. Um, the question was asked, what if we sell, you know, what if somebody buys the, you know, sells the project five years in? That's actually a very common scenario. Uh, the tax exemption and the affordability stay in place regardless of who the owner is. So that, that's, a, that's done in stone. So, but thank you, Mary, for your time. Good morning. Mary. Good morning, my judge, uh, Charles. <coughs> and, uh, indeed, the whole MFI household size thing is problematic, and it's not really resolved when we go to the, uh, the individual breakouts for these items. Um, I know it's a little bit, you know, frustrating to hammer this because we past inclusionary zoning and the agenda guide coming up is going to talk about changing the procedure for this to a five-year uh, rolling cash. But I think that uh, public sentiment also needs to be addressed. Are there any developers who go beyond a floor of 20% units? You know, even though they don't get additional tax abatement, um, and you know, I can understand why there isn't. But uh, I hope that when we move on from this and to the other item, we'll talk about uh, incentivizing and, you know, uh, just positive reinforcement for developers that you know, are settling for the last good dollar, just squeezing every last, you know, red cent out and making sure that these, when we design these smaller studio apartments that, oh, look at that. They don't have washer dryer connections, but the studio apartments on the other floor have washer dryer connections and 10% more square feet or something like that. So I don't know if we really get it. But the other, the most critical issue though is uh, when we look at two of the specific properties. Um, one is at Third and Ash, and I can't believe you're going to approve it without calling it the Voodoo Donuts Palatial Estates. Oh, palatial Estates. The other is that the proper name for all these places got pushed out 91st, uh, deep south, 5728, 91st. All of these places would have better marketability if they were all the Woody Guthrie estates across every corner of Portland. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, just, just to answer your question, um, when it comes to private sector development, uh, as a practical matter, you can get down to about 30% MFI through you know, various incentives, tax abatements, and all that. Below 30% MFI, 
you're really talking about government housing, and we do that too. And so the bond that the public the just supported creates two hundred and sixty million dollars uh, for all manner of housing. Uh, below thirty percent is really nonprofits like Proud Brown that you've heard in here, uh, Habitat for Humanity that you've heard in here, some of the neighborhood. Uh, exactly, exactly. So, um, and then the, the kinds of things Commissioner Fish were was talking about uh, with uh, Bud Clark comments and some of the other permanent supportive housing options. Those are those are typically government, nonprofit. Was there any language in the bond to address in particular that like everybody under sixty MFI, or is that something that's hammered out? Fifty percent. Fifty percent. Thirty percent. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Deeply, deeply informed. Right. Thank you. Good conversation. So